Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Ali. I'm a grateful alcoholic. Uh, uh, grateful to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the Bronx uh, meeting, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, people that are, uh, from my experience, people that are true, that are seeking on this path, uh, the spirit talks to them. And, uh, and, and when we answer the knock on the door or follow the spiritual breadcrumbs, at least of beautiful things and this meeting, this movement that you guys have seems to be one of those beautiful things that I, I sometimes spy on your nightly big book things when I can, you know, I sleep a little early because of family and stuff or, or, um, uh, I really enjoyed what you what you're doing. This this movement is, which is really uh, the movement of Alcoholics Anonymous, people that really love this program. So I want to thank from the bottom of my heart the committee that runs this whole thing together. I know a couple of names. Please forgive me if I don't know everybody. You know, from Matt to Alice and uh, you know Stacy and Kevin and everyone else. Uh, there's a lot of uh, when it happens with movements and conferences stuff like this. There's a lot of quiet, humble service in the background that we don't see and we don't talk about. A couple of people pop up as faces of the movement sometimes, but we're all specks in this wheel, man. So I want to thank all of you guys. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing and for your gracious invitation. Uh, I was, uh, my sponsor is Butch M from Barrie, Canada. He's a beautiful, loving man. I've been so blessed that God put a, such a loving man who carries a big book and walks softly on this path to, to guide me, to journey with, you know, I love him very much. Um, I was separated from alcohol on January the 4th of 2012, and I've been in the middle of the circle and triangle uh, to the best of my ability with you guys since then, living a beautiful life, living a life filled with a deep sense of meaning and purpose. As a result of uh, the circle and triangle, the fellowship and the traditions and the service and the steps and everything that that involved, the the circle and triangle, I have tapped into a power. I've tapped into a loving power that's literally scrapped me from the scrap people left and put me in the most beautiful life today. You know, as a result of this, this beautiful program that you guys introduced me to, um, I got to tell you, man, I, my heart is full. I, I, I wish I could open up my heart and, and just let you see and feel the joy and serenity and peace and, and, and just ecstasy at times that I feel most times. And when I say most times, Sometimes that is 51% of the time, but it's still most times, you know, I, I, and I wish I could, I, I wish I could show you uh, at the same time when life throws curveballs and, 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 and life's in session, man, I'm in the depths of sometimes despair and sadness in recovery. I wish I could, I could show you the feeling, the knowing that everything's going to be all right, man, because God always talks to me no matter what's going on in my life. I wish I could show you, but I can't. I won't do it justice for the next 40 or 50, whatever minutes that God's going to speak through me. The Spirit's going to guide me to speak. I'm going to, with my finite mind and my little, uh, limited brain and, and my limited language, I'm going to probably make some mouth noises. Blah, 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 blah. That's supposed to describe this beautiful path. Are you kidding me? How can you describe infinite power? How can you describe infinite love? How can you describe this beautiful life and do it justice? That's, do it justice. I can't. I can't. And you know, at the same time, this as much transformations and beauty and experiences that I've had in this program, the disease of alcoholism is well and alive and it's cunning and baffling. In the last few years, it has made me fall asleep to the delusion that somehow, that perhaps this is not a path of progress, it's a path of perfection. It has made me fall asleep to the delusion that this is a path of perfection and looking good and the image to uphold in AA and the meetings that you speak at and number of sponsees that you have and everyone should do it this way and not you, it's your way. And whoo, that was a painful little time, period of time, you know, but it's not. See, the truth is that I'm not here to teach anybody anything. If, if ever my, my energy is like that, please forgive me. That's just my enthusiasm for the program. I am, I am perfectly, I, I, I am very present to the fact that I'm just a speck among specks, that I don't know anything, that I'm not here to represent Alcoholics Anonymous or teach anything to anybody. I'm here to share with you my brokenness. That's it. I'm here to share with you the wounds and the armor, the gash and the, and the psyche and the emotions and the spirit, because that is where God shines through. From my experience, God carries his water in broken pots. That's where God shines through. That's where we get to be useful to each other. 
That's where that's that that's how I have grown immensely because of your generosity. You telling me that, Ali, I was brokenhearted like that too. But look at what spiritual principles have done, have carried me through it. One of the ways that that delusion that I, I gotta match up to some perfection, some ideal manifested in my life many ways. As I said, I've been fumbling, stumbling through this path, man. I still live in a beautiful life. That's how powerful this program is. Fumbling, stumbling. One of the ways that it manifested in my life was in 2000, as I told you, I was separated from alcohol in 2012, and I've been deep in the middle of the circle and trying, deep as in, for me, not comparing to anyone. The seeking has been deep. The yearning has been deep for me. Yet, yet uh, coming up to five years in 2016, I had to renew my dry date. And there's a reason why I share it this way. I had to renew my dry date because my ego got attached to external things. And I've named a lot of them already. My, I, I, my ego got attached to looking good. And I would stop sharing myself honestly with a circle of people that, are, that love me, my sponsor, and other, yeah? share about my brokenness. And this disease started to separate me from me. And it waited. This disease waits patiently. I don't need to tell you. I don't need to worry about what you think about me and my secrets because this disease knows my secrets. It just waits patiently. It waited. And 2016, September, my wife went for some minor surgery. She came home. She's an alcoholic. Me, she's sober a little over 10 years, 10 and a half years. Um, she came home with some Percocets, uh, painkillers, a doctor not, uh, that prescribed for pain. And uh, I found myself over, over a couple of nights taking about five of them. So I had to renew my dry date. So my sobriety day is September the 8th of 2016. But here's the thing. I share it that way because, because from that time to this, something happened to me. All the things that I, uh, the, 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 the time in sobriety and speaking engagements and number of sponsors, all the things that I would profess and sometimes I would believe that don't really matter, start to matter a lot when it was taken away. And you know what else happened? I dove back in the steps. I dove back in the program with a different kind of humility and honesty. And I've had a deeper relationship with this power, man. Whew, and it wouldn't have happened if that did not. I guess God's like, you know what? You have enough spiritual uh, currency in the bank that I, I got some more work for you to do. You're not going nowhere. You stay with us for a little bit longer, I guess. I'm not sure, right? And I know that everything that happens to me, I am clear that everything that happens to me is actually happening for me. It's happening for me because, because I can use it to, uh, it, it'll be a useful experience to help one of God's other kids. And I've been sharing about this story in this way, not at this length. I don't know why it's coming at me like this right now. I've been sharing for four and a half years since I renewed my sobriety. And I knew God is using me. I knew it. But God gave me a gift last week. I got a Facebook message from a, from a Facebook friend, from a friend that lives close to us. And we met through Facebook, the Zoom, Zoom area. And uh, Zoom era, and uh, it sent me a message saying, uh, Ali, I'm so grateful to you because after 20 years of sobriety, I renewed my dry day because my sobriety was sort of peppered with a couple of pills here and there, a little bit too much, a little bit that, and I realized that, man, that dishonesty has been keeping me in bondage, and I'm now free, and I'm able to cry and share that now. I will to cry and share that because that's the loophole. One of the loopholes that alcoholism uses to take us out are the things that we think we are powerful over. Oh, you never had a problem with pills. I know a lot of people that went out drinking eventually and dying because of prescription pills. Anyways, I'm sober because of a loving God. And if the word God bothers you, arises, antipathy in you, I want to tell you that I understand exactly where you are. I'm not judging you. I was there too at one time. I was born in a country that was uh, that uh, religious government theocracy. Religious government took over uh, close to 50 years ago. I'm 44 years old. Close to 50 years ago, took over and and they start to kill in the name of God and rape in the name of God and and uh, imprison and torture some some of my extended family members in the name of God. So that's partially the idea of God that I brought for you guys to deal with in these rooms. So I understand if you have an antipathy towards the word God. But let me tell you, the actual word God doesn't mean a single thing for me. Just a word. What I'm seeking is the power behind the word. Because I'm powerless to stay sober. I'm powerless to live a sane and sound life. I can't do it on my own, man. I need a power. I need a power. And I'm so grateful for the old timers, for the long timers, some of whom are in this call. I admire you. I cherish you. You're the voice of AA. You're the leaders in AA. The traditions tell me. So God speaks through you to me. 
because I wasn't one of those souls to get it right away. I was in and out of the program for about seven years, dying in this disease. And it was your light. It was your handshakes and your smiles and your kindness that, that was like a ray of hope for me in that, in that despair. In those suicide attempts, it was you. It's going to be okay, kid. Keep coming back. See, you showed me what it is to walk this path. What it is to actually walk these 12 steps as a way of life rather than assignments. You showed me. Because one of those times when I, uh, I think one of those times when I was in, just newly introduced to AA, uh, I, once again, this disease has taken me to many suicide attempts. It's the suicide thought came because I can't stay sober. I spent all my loan money, student loan money, uh, and uh, I, I didn't have any food in the fridge. I was renting a little room in a student co-op. Wanted to kill myself with a good bottle of pills, bottle of vodka there. I, I gazed at the small little meeting book on, on the dresser. I opened it and I ran to a meeting. It was raining, it was pouring. I ran to a meeting. I was crying, man. I was like, I can't, I, why do I keep doing this? And I sat at the meeting and I don't remember what kind of meeting it was, but it must have been some kind of discussion involved because I shared what I just shared with you, that I have no food in the fridge. I have no rent money. I, don't, I want to kill myself. I, I don't understand this. And it was you beautiful awakened old timers that sat beside me, put your hands around me. And at that time were awakened enough that you knew that I wasn't going to get any talk of a serious talk about God or in that discussion of a fourth step. You took me grocery shopping. You helped me carry the bags to my fridge. You taught me and you still teach me and I love you. And you're not thanked enough by Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you so much for being here. I love the old timers, man. So what the old timers would do, getting back to the God idea, what the old timers would do is I, I would come to them and just, just arguing about their God and the 12 steps. And I'm dying in this disease. I can't stay sober. And I'm coming here arguing with people that are sober. Insane, right? So they wouldn't miss a beat. They wouldn't put me down. They wouldn't judge me. Hey, Ali, come on, have a seat, man. Take it easy. Well, why don't you come up with your own conception of God? Why don't you come up with your own conception of God? So I'm begging you. I'm going to use the word God a lot more in this spiritual conversation. If it's bothering you, please come up with your own conception of God. Whether it's a soul of a loved one that's passed on or spirit of the universe. Uh, whether it's the collective consciousness of this beautiful group, which is a power greater than I could ever be. Come up with your own conception of God. I was born in Iran in 1976, born in a country, uh, lived at extremes, uh, in country, in a family that lived there, yeah, country was at extremes too, family that lived at extremes. One extreme was just love and joy and extended family, huge extended family, family parties and encouragement, man, it was a good childhood, right? Part of it. The other part, the other extreme was violence and hitting and bleeding and fear and my eyes addiction and just absolute terror. I didn't know which dad I'm going to wake up to or which family I'm going to wake up to. I was always afraid. I was just always afraid. I was always worried, always afraid, always thinking what people are going to think about me. Always trying to lose, use something outside of me to make me feel better about whatever this, this ease is that I'm feeling inside. You told me, I had no idea what it was. You gave me the language here. You told me, Ali, it's a God-sized soul. You can't fill it with things. You can't fill it with job and money and girlfriends and accolades and approval of kids on the street and love of your parents. Can't be filled. I didn't know that. That's what I was trying to do. Just feeling empty all the time. After, after I achieve whatever it is, I think will make me feel better about me and this life. For, I, it would last for a short period of time and then I'm still feeling empty. I'm still chasing the next thing. I didn't know about the spiritual malady. In 1986, Iran and Iraq, at that time, they were in war for about five years with each other. In 86, they started to bomb each other's capital cities. The first five years, it was border cities that they were fighting. The war was around. They, they, the first set of bombings, first few sets of dom bombings, a uh, few of them landed within kilometers of our house in Tehran, capital city of Iran, where we lived. And I remember with every bombing that was fairly close, like kilometers from the house, what happens is that the house shakes. like It's like an earthquake. And the windows would break and, and, and the sirens would go off. And I guess my sister and I were too naive as kids to really uh, understand the gravity of the situation that we could at any minute die. But my mom 
wasn't she, she was old enough and she you know she was she was afraid crippled by fear she ended up in a mental hospital for a month and my father just locked up the house nobody would trade in real estate at that time gathered all the money that he could we're a middle class family we're doing fine and but for the grace of a loving god within three or four months of deciding we and we landed in canada there's a lot of families that i know of my wife included when they were kids and they led that to leave through mountains it took them months and years years i mean for us within four months loving god we landed in this beautiful country at the age of 10 i'm a proud canadian iranian we landed in this beautiful country filled with filled with kind loving open minded people and and freedom of religion and freedom of speech and opportunity and and you would think a normal person you would think that i would start to live a good life then and that i would start to be okay then but that wasn't the case for me see what happened was that my father's addiction and all the chaos that accompanies that followed us here however more pertinent to my story more relevant to who i am as an alcoholic my diseased sick brain followed me here i haven't had a drink yet i'm not an alcoholic i have to have had one and have a problem with it to be an alcoholic but at that time i guess the best way to describe it my pre drink brain filled with the isms of alcoholism followed me here and it, and this brain continued to cherry pick evidence in my life why i'm not enough why i'm not okay see the kids on the street make fun of you you look different than them they beat you up you're not enough you're never going to amount to nothing you don't speak a word of english you can't understand them you're not enough your father is an addict he beat you you're not enough insane how this disease always wants me to look at the outside for for how i am in, on the inside frightening it is see because i used to blame my alcoholism on the on the outside on my upbringing listen everyone's experience is different all i'm saying is that from the evidence that i have in my life i don't believe that anymore not that trauma as a kid doesn't of course it does I, in fact i don't know a human being that's not broken to some degree especially when someone that faces trauma as a child you become wounded but see my younger sister who's 5 years younger than me she pretty much experienced the same chaos and trauma as i did not an alcoholic not an addict and she's tried drinking cocaine everything on the sun she's experimented with not an alcoholic not an addict when the when the substance started to hurt her life she put it away and she she got her solution from psychiatrists and therapists and motivational speakers and motivational books and ashrams and meditate ooh she's an amazing human being i don't have to tell you how many uh, psychiatrists and therapists i've been to you know and then i would come into these rooms and i would meet you beautiful people with your generosity you would sit me down some of you and you would tell me about your perfect lives growing up you would tell me about your leave it to beaver lives growing up you would tell me about your uh, about your uh, ski trips and uh, and parents that didn't drink and nobody hit anybody that was a surprise to me by the way people don't hit each other at home I, that was a surprise for me they don't they're not supposed to hit each other in general nobody hit anybody and they were happy and what you shared with me is that ali despite my what you would think perfect upbringing i still never felt like i fit and when i drank it treated that oh inside job inside job my recovery in my life is independent of my external it is dependent on the relationship with god oh inside job i got you i'm an alcoholic because i like the effect produced by alcohol it feels that god's highest hope to such a degree that i chase it to the gates of insanity and death and i did that for 10 years after it stopped working for me i would drink my body would be drunk my mind still racing it stopped working for me i would drink my body would be drunk uh, i'm full of fear still and i still want to kill myself it used to treat that what happened that's what it looks like if you're wondering for 10 years putting my hand on a hot stove ow 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 it'll be different this time hold on i'll show you ow ow insane and say I started to drink at the age of 16 and in hindsight I I see that not everyone felt like I thought they felt I thought they felt like me when I, when they drank I felt like I fit in my own skin the world made sense I had my I had my first spiritual experience with my 
first time I got drunk. And my world was huge with potential. Everyone kept on saying, now he has potential, so much potential. Uh, pre, pre-med, uh, at that time they called it pre-med, now general sciences. Pre-med in university and, and uh, possible uh, Olympic carding game trials for the Canadian carding game, not the actual Olympic game, it's a carding game, it's a process you have to go through, right? And for, for a sport I was involved in heavily, I has potential. At the end of my drinking, all oh, this world of potential was this small in a grungy motel room in Southeast Scarborough, that's Southeast Toronto, with a needle in my arm, with needles in my arm and a bottle of vodka and all that ugly extra curricular activity that follows that kind of lifestyle. Wanted to die every moment of the day and didn't know how not to. Whew, that's so painful, man. You know? And I wasn't planning to do that. I suffered from when I first started to drink. I wasn't planning to go there. I suffered from a terrifying illness. Every part of it like boggles my mind how it, I learned about in doctor's opinion, the allergy of the body in which my body reacts differently than 95% of the people out there to the consumption of alcohol. When I drink, the craving starts then. The craving doesn't start when I'm sober. That's a normal person's way of talking about craving. When I drink, something intensifies. It's a fire that starts to burn ferociously where it just takes my mind and my body conspire to kill me where I have to go, 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 go. I keep going until bank accounts are done. I, I quit my, I got fired from my job. Relationships are dead. My mom's heart's broken and I don't see her tears. Like I see them, but I don't get it. I don't see them. I remember one time she was holding on to my leg. We were living in a condo apartment. She, she knew that I started to drink and the drink was on me, right? And I had to go and she knew. And the poor thing, she was holding onto my leg on the ground, begging me not to go. And I just shook her off and I kicked her and I left. I see, but I don't see. Selfish, self-centered, conceited, arrogant, inconsiderate, active alcoholic that I was. Don't see? Couple that physical allergy with a mental twist, mental blank spot, they call it. So cunning and baffling and terrifying that I can't trust my brain. I can't trust the organ in my body that's supposed to categorize situations and, and tell me not to do that. Don't go there. Don't drink that. It's not safe. Look, look, 10 years of your life. Every time you drank, you, you killed something, destroyed something in your life. Don't do that. It's got a virus in it. Left of my own devices, I will always drink. A drink is always an option left of my own power. Step one doesn't say I can't drink. It says I will drink on my own power. Guaranteed. I'm powerless. I'm powerless. As I said earlier, this disease took me to a few suicide attempts. One of these suicide attempts, I had taken razor blades on my wrist, downed a bottle of vodka, and stole and downed 30 of my dad's Tylenol 3s. He was always on and off opiates and opioids. I'm just waiting there to die. My poor, my poor mother finds me. That's okay. There's something I want to share, but I don't want to share. My poor mother find, uh, uh, finds me. We ended up in an emergency room. Uh, they gave me some charcoal drink to drink. And then I ended up in a, in a mental, uh, uh, what do they call it? Psych ward on the ninth or 10th floor of that hospital. And the next day or two, I'm, I'm there with the psychiatrist and his office. My mother's there and she's bawling her eyes and I'm crying too. And I, and I meant it with every fiber of my being when I told her for the hundredth time that I'm not gonna do this again. I won't break your heart again. I won't break your heart again. I meant it. If you would have hooked up a polygraph test to me, I would have passed it. I kept on making her believe it because I believed it. I believed it. I think it was a week or so later that they let me out. Ding, 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 ding. A drink would fix that. You were just going through a phase. That suicide attempt was just a phase. That's what it tells me and I believe it. You just needed the right girlfriend, the right relationship. That's what, that was your problem. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. Meanwhile, I'm dying in this. Uh, Bill Wilson talked many beautiful descriptions of the spiritual malady in our book. But the one that always jumps at me, one of them is, is uh, what do you say? Bitter morass of self-pity. Loneliness. Quicksand all around me. I'm sinking. My skin hurts. Literally and physic physically. It hurts. Figuratively, it hurts. I can't breathe. I don't understand how to live life. I don't understand the way you, I perceive you guys on the outside to move forward in this life. 
with your jobs and promotions and houses and pay your bills and your relationships. They stay with you. They don't leave you. Girlfriends and wives and husbands and kids. What are you talking about? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> you know? I just want to die. I didn't know how that, I didn't know how to laugh. I thought people that were that like they used to have belly laughs. I I thought they're faking. I didn't think that was possible. It was so dark for me for so many years. And as God in His infinite mercy has always had angels around me, His other kids around me to give me messages. Always, I just never been awake. But the first time that I remember really being awake was in 2006 when I got 12 steps. A beautiful gentleman. Oh, what a man of God he is. What a humble walk he has, Saeed. He 12 he stepped me, introduced me to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I fell in love with you guys, with the camaraderie and the joyousness and, and, and the fact that you guys thought like me and you would express those thoughts without shame. <laughs> and you felt like me and you would express those feelings without shame. And you drank like me. And you never judged me. And you kept on telling me, keep coming back. I felt like I found my tribe. I felt like we chewed the same dirt. And I was happy and really ecstatic in the program for five or six months that I found a group of people that are like me. And there's a, there's a category for what I have. It's an actual illness. And some of them, some, they seem to be happy and sober, some of them. And after about five or six months, I, think, I guess the, the disease woke up in my head and started to focus and magnify the tragedy of my life and all the things that I've wasted and all the things that I don't have. I didn't have a solution. So without a solution, obviously the disease says, hey, a drink would fix that. Come on. For years, I was in and out of this program, dying, dying. Thinking that I'm doing what you're telling me, thinking that I'm doing what you're telling me. I went to your 90 and 90 and 100 and 100 meetings, whatever it is. I set up your coffee pots and, and, and set up your chairs and shook hands at your, the front of the rooms, went for coffee before and after, fellowship. I did all of that and I kept on drinking and dying in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was confused and I was angry and I was depressed. And I was asleep to the fact that the reason I'm like that is because I wanted something for nothing. I think in pictures sometimes and analogies help me dumb things down for me. And I've always been in sports. So one analogy that really helps me get present to what I was doing is if I imagine if I want to get into physical shape and I go to a gym and I make a plan to go to this gym 90 times in 90 days and clean the machines and shake hands with people. And when I'm at this gym 90 times in 90 days, talk to the people that have amazing physiques and get inspired by the stories and what they do. And then instead of working out, I come back home 90 times a night. That's why I did an Alcoholics Anonymous. Just attend meetings and get inspired by your stories for that hour and go home and die. See, if I want to get in physical shape, I got to, of course, join a gym, let's say, right? But I got to jump and treadmill and lift the weights. I got to do, I got to take some actions. In this program, all the things that I mentioned to you are absolutely an integral part of my life and my recovery, uh, home group, service position at that home group, fellowship when I can, uh, our sponsorship, obviously, all of those things. All those fingers point to something. They point to the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which in itself points to a power greater than me because I am powerless, man. I am beyond human help. I love your love. I love the fellowship. I cherish it. I really do. But see, I suffer from an illness so powerful that love is not enough. Love's not enough. If love was enough, my mother's love would have been enough. That love trumps, excuse the pun, outside issue. That love trumps your love. Mother's love. That's a powerful love, man. I couldn't stay sore because of my mother's love. So just your love and love is not enough. If your love inspires me to take some action and tap into a power, that's a beautiful thing. That's a different story. That's a different story. You know? And God put another teacher in my path and we opened up the big, this gentleman, uh, the first person that I can remember, that I can remember, that was 
couple of decades in sobriety really was about the big book, open the big book with me. And we started to work the steps through the steps and, and I started to be able to breathe. And as I said earlier, I have fumbled and stumbled through this path. I can, it is only my brokenness that has brought me, uh, my imperfections that have allowed me to experience the perfection of God at times and made me useful, right? So one of the ways that I've fumbled and stumbled is that at around eight or nine months of sobriety, um, my ego was rebuilding at the same time and I had no idea I couldn't see it. So what it looked like is that I got the job that I liked, I got the girlfriend that I thought I loved and about eight months of sobriety, I, I started to, I got in my amend, uh, I'm at my amends process, step nines, didn't make one single amends. I stopped ever so slowly meeting with my sponsor for step work and book work. I stopped ever so slowly uh, going to meetings. This disease is cunning and baffling. Slowly. You know, like I've been, I've been on vacation before on the beach, and then you, 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 you know, I was sitting on a tube and just right in front of the, by the shore. And I just sort of started to daydream. And then all of a sudden, I'm looking around like, oh, my God, I'm so far away. I'm like right in the middle of the sea, man. That's how this disease took me. Ever so slowly. All of a sudden, I'm away from you guys. I haven't gone to a meeting in a long time. Life is perfect, though. I'm feeling good. I have what the ego wants. I feel like my version of uh, Fred, uh, more about alcoholism, not a cloud in the horizon. And then the drink called me. Hey, you've been good for like eight months. You're living a beautiful life. I think it's okay for you to go watch the fights with the guys and have a couple of pints. One drink. That's all I wanted. One drink. Three years. My plan was to have one drink. Three years. Some of the worst pain and despair and depression, a couple of suicide attempts in those three years. And let me tell you from experience, it is a different kind of bewilderment and pain and depression. When you have tasted at least a little bit of the solution <laughs> and you have a head full of AA and you think you know, and, and you think you know what it is and where, where, the, where the solution is, but your feet won't take you there. My feet wouldn't take me there. That's a different kind of pain. That's a different kind of pain. And my last drunk wasn't as bad as the 50 before. I was renting a room in a, in a men's recovery house. I had gone out drinking for the night. I was sober for four months without any step work, went out drinking for the night, came, snuck back in because I didn't want to get, I didn't want to get kicked out. And I found myself in a state of tremendous pain, physical, body hurt, spiritual, mental, emotional, minds racing. I just want to crawl out on my own skin. And I just want to drink. I just want to end my life once again. And I had a profound spiritual experience, profound, profound in the depths of pain, something folded my knees. My friend Jane just talked, and I listened to her talk. What a beautiful talk that was. She says, I have heard God refer to as something so many times in these rooms. <laughs> something bent my knees. And I prayed like I've never prayed before from the bottom of my soul. Like I really prayed. I said something like, God, Whatever you are, wherever you are, can you just please help me not be like this anymore? I just don't want to be like this anymore. I was surrendered. I don't have the power to surrender. I was surrendered. And here's a spiritual experience, like as in a shift in thinking, right? That's what a spiritual experience is, a different outlook on life. After that prayer, I'm still full of pain in every way you can imagine, unbearable pain, but I didn't want to drink and I didn't want to kill myself. I just didn't want to be like that anymore. So I picked up the phone and I called you guys. And you know who I called? I didn't call the guy who was full of big book knowledge and da -da 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 -da, even though I became him later on for a period of time in my young sobriety, right? I didn't call that guy. I called the guy that was kind and loving I practice these principles. I call that guy. I felt safe with that guy. And I came back and he sent me to a lady, to a native Indian lady, because he didn't have time. God sent me another angel in my path, Donna. And she opened the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with me. And we started to go through it line by line. We started to go through it line by line. That's just the way it worked for me. It doesn't have to be that way for you. We follow the black on the white, literally. 
if I said to identify with something, I would identify if I could. And I, and I started to be able to breathe. I started to be able to identify what it is to be an alcoholic. Not just intellectually, like physical allergy, mental twist, no, experientially. I brought my brokenness to it. I poured my experience on it. And I started to be able to see myself at one with Bill Wilson. A human being that's a different race, different color, different religion, different economic, social background than me, lived in a different era, I started to see myself in him. I'm an alcoholic. And that step one experience drove me to the rest of the steps. Just drove me. Went through the inventory process and for the first time ever, I was unplugged from the ego for a period, for a period of time. I saw for the first time ever at that time, all the things that I complain about in life, you, the government, my parents, jobs, girlfriends, better than, less than, fearful, all of those, one common denominator. You're looking at him. It was me. It was me. It was me. I woke up to the fact that I was the one driving in Bronx, New York, with a map of Toronto in my hand, hitting people, pissed off at them, going, at one, going down one ways and complaining. It was me. I was, it was me. I became free of that. You know that father that I told you about? I woke up, man. I woke up to the fact that the poor guy, he did the best he could with what he had. For years, I was demanding something from him that he didn't have. It wasn't given to him to give to me. And he suffered from the same disease that I'm suffering from without a solution. And my, my eyes opened up spiritually and I saw all the things that he did do with what he had. We never went hungry. We never went without. Always had my back financially. Always had my back in any way that he could. Picked us up like lion cubs in the middle of a war. Left his home and everything that was dear to him. Can you imagine that? Imagine that. Four years old, two kids and a wife. You move to a country which you don't know anything about. You look different than most of the people there. You don't speak a word of English. Can you imagine that? The fear that his addicted mind was pushed through that. So I can have a better life today. I saw that. Whew. And then I saw what kind of son I was. I got to see that, the terror I caused, the self-righteousness and the judgment, the yelling and the stealing, the demeaning, the blaming at the age of 35 for all the failures of my life or what that poor guy had no control over. I saw that. And then immense till later on, I became free and sort of free. This program is about freedom, man. Not, not relief. <laughs> it's about freedom. And I had a powerful step six and seven experience. My first round of the steps, my first round of the steps. Powerful. And this, if that hasn't been your experience, that's okay too. Because the big book is clear. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but it always materializes if we work for them. Always does. And with the, my step one experience, it was all so close to me, the experience of it, the gift of desperation, gift, that's what that is. We went through the immense process in a fairly quick period of time, as in I made all the amends that I could, all the approaches that I could at that time. And with every single amends, I got a piece of my soul back. My alcoholic thinking, Bill Wilson talks about in, 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 the, in the hospital room with Abby when he got sober for the last time, he talks about uh, uh, uncommon sense becomes, uh, became common sense or common sense became something like that. Uncommon sense, right? My common sense is I would get self-esteem by doing for me. Going to the gym, dressing nicely, getting a nice job, nice car, nice girlfriend, then I'll feel okay. And you know why I'll feel that way? Because he would tell me that I'm okay. Always dependent on you and your approval. That's what one common sense would. I learned in the immense process, especially, especially in the immense process. Oh, oh man. My self-esteem, my confidence has come from trying to heal the wounds that I caused his other kids. Trying to make amends, setting right the wrongs. 
And I watched as I made financial romance, even a little bit at a time. I watched how financial abundance either came in my life or if it didn't, I stopped being so afraid of it not being there. I watched it happen. I watched as I continued to make amends with the people that I've harmed. I watched love come in my life in the most impossible situations and scenarios. I watched it. I watched it, man. And I started to, I started to work with the disciplines of 10 and 11, you know? I used to think, you know, step 10 has such a beautiful promise. The first promise they throw out at you is you have entered the world of the spirit. On page, what is it? 84, 85? You, you've entered the world of the spirit. Enter the world, and I have a function. My next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. In understanding and effectiveness of the realm of the spirit. In understanding and effectiveness of, of being a servant. How I can serve God's other kids. In understanding and effectiveness. You know? And I used to think, and then it started to make sense in step 10 when it was taught to me, when I started to practice with the beautiful practice of step 10 throughout the day, I started to realize what those old timers were talking about. When they were saying, I stay sober one day at a time. I got what they were saying because I was frustrated for years. And I would say, what do you mean? I can't, like, oh, that, that statement would just, oh man, because I couldn't stay sober one minute, one hour. How do you do it one day? Then I understood. What they were saying is that we live this program to the best of our ability and develop a relationship with this power one day at a time. God takes care of the rest of that stuff, the sobriety and all that kind of stuff. It's God's deal, man. I got it. And I started to sponsor early on in sobriety. If this hasn't been your experience, uh, that's okay. I'm not saying you should or everybody should. No, I'm saying this is my experience. At three and a half, four months of sobriety, I'm sponsoring people. I'm taking people through the steps as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I, I was scared when my elders and my sponsor and my, uh, around me said, that's what you got to do. I was scared. I guess they did because they knew me six and a half, seven years in another program dying. You know, they must have thought this kid is really, this disease really has him. He's so into self, you better start passing it out or else he's going to die. So they encouraged me to do that. They fanned that flame that was, that, was, uh, that was started inside of me. They fanned it. They encouraged it. And when I would argue with them and say, no, um, I'm scared. What do I have to offer? They would remind me very sternly, very kindly and sternly sometimes. That's interesting, Ali, because if everybody, if Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob had some rule that they, they wrote in stone that you must have one year before starting to sponsor, they would be dead. We would be dead. There's no Alcoholics Anonymous. You'd probably be drunk by now. They said, it's none of your business when, how, and to whom you pass this message on. When you're at step 12 and you are there now, you pray. Let God take care of the rest. So I would pray. In the mornings, I would pray, God, would you, if you see fit, would you please don't put a sponsor in my path because I don't want to drink and die. Thank you, God. <laughs> Something like that, you know? God, in his infinite mercy, had me, uh, um, the spirit had me uh, chair a meeting in, in a men's shelter in downtown Toronto, where these men were broken, and they were sharing from that brokenness. And I would, the format, I made it up. I would open the big book and read three pages from the big book, and they would share. And then I would share about how I was exactly like them four months ago, and I'm not. I don't want to kill myself. I'm sober four or five months ago, and I guess... I guess they start to trust the, how tangible four or five months is more than 20 years. I don't know. Because they would come up to me after, after the meeting and say, hey, can you just help us do whatever happened to you? I'm sure I can. I'll take you through the big book. And that's what I did. That's what my sponsorship would look like. And I would forget. And I would make mistakes. I would call my elders. How did that go again? What was that call them on? <laughs> on? I have no idea if any of those first set of men that were gifted to me, if any of them were sober. But I know that I'm sober. I stayed sober. I stayed sober. We're all, we're all, what we're doing is, there's another spiritual teacher talks about uh, at the best of times, at our best, we're walking each other home. That's what we're doing. All of us in Alcoholics Anonymous, what we're doing, we're, we're just riding the waves of the language of love that was started 85 years ago. 
from one conversation of one alcoholic to another. That's what we're doing, language of love. And you know this program, this language of love, that we feel the ripple effects of it all over through our communities and our lives and our kids and parents? It didn't start because Bill Wilson had an agenda to keep people sober, by the way. He tried that for the first six months. 90-something people, by all the archives and letters, he tried to pull people off of bar stools. People didn't stay sober. He stayed sober, but the language of love didn't start. It started because he wanted to drink himself in the Mayflower Hotel, walking back and forth, spent all his money, his business deal went out the dumps. The drink called him, and then the spirit turned his gaze at the phone book. One thing led to another. Dr. Bob and him were supposed to meet for 50 minutes, hours, language of love. So I stayed sober. I stayed sober. And I like to think that I'm a better sponsor these days because I have more life experience applying principles to the life, you know? And I got to tell you, I wouldn't be sober if it wasn't for both having a sponsor and, and being a sponsor. I wouldn't be sober. I wouldn't be sober because life has thrown curveballs, man, in the last few short years of sobriety. Life's in session. We've had deaths and cancers that we've dealt with in the family. We've had, a, I've had depression on and off. Ever since I was a kid, I would get, get outside help, inside help, doctors, staffs, all that. Once in a while, it would grab a hold of me. We've had a, a financial troubles and business trouble. I've had three business uh, failures. Couldn't get a job to support my family. I'd get one, but not enough to help support the family. Question what I am as a man, what I am as a father, what, what I am as a husband. A lot of stuff. My wife and I got separated, almost got divorced. A lot of stuff, man. Life's got valleys. But here's the beautiful thing. Because of sponsorship, because of getting out of self and sponsoring people, because of trying to help God's other kids, what happened is that through these valleys, Every single time I was brought back to the table with God for a deeper experience, for a deeper level of surrender. I became a better human being through these valleys. I became more compassionate. I became less judgmental. Because <laughs> I experienced the pain, man. And then I experienced this power do for me what I can't do for myself. I experienced it. I'm so grateful for all the teachers that are around me, that have been around me. My, my amazing sponsor, Butch, and my beautiful friend, Teresa F. from California. There's plenty. Saeed, all the teachers that are around me. Because every time I go to them with something, with a tragedy on my left, with pro what I perceive, my disease perceives to be a problem, you know what they do? They kindly listen to me. They share their experience with that subject and uh, applying spiritual principles. Then they point me to God. They point me to some uh, inventory, amends, uh, prayer meditation, helping. They point me to an action that leads me to God because I'm beyond human help. I told you that earlier. I'm beyond human help. I used to live my life, excuse my language, ass backwards, trying to dress up this monkey, fix the outside so that it would work its way to the inside. I feel good. Uh oh, man, it's the other way around. <laughs> other way around. See, I don't suffer from a drinking problem. I suffer from a drinking solution. There's a big difference. I suffer from alcoholism. It's a soul sickness and it's a spiritual malady. It's a soul sickness that has me feeling separate from you. All the time, on my own power, that is. On my own power. I'm always feeling I'm better than you or I'm less than you. I'm afraid of what you think about me. A spiritual illness that's so cunning and baffling that now is never okay. It keeps taking me out of the now. Go to the future, go to the past. <laughs> Figment of my imagination, figment of my disease. And this, this spiritual malady that uh, loves me to the sleep that I'm se separate from you leads me to the biggest delusion of all, that I am separate from this power, that God is some entity up there. If I believe sometimes, if I don't, but that's not the case for me today. That's going to be further from the truth of my life today. And God is closer to me than breath. I am present to his love and magnificence. I am present more times than not. And that's a beautiful thing for someone like me, for a broken soul like me. More times than not. 
and I've had to cultivate that relationship. There was a period of time when I was sponsoring a lot of people and, 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 and talking about the transformations in my life, which were true, and at the same time coming through these rooms and lying to you a couple of years in, on fire with this thing but lying to you. The disease had me again, I didn't know it. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. And a teacher came in my past. What that looked like in my life is that transformation in certain areas of life, talking about it in meetings, not talking about brokenness. And what I looked like in my life is that if you would have followed me with one of those, you know, candid camera, hitting camera things, they, right? Those shows. If you would have followed me, some areas of life, you would have said, this guy's still drinking. Look at the way he's behaving. Some areas of life. And a teacher came on my path. And I was asked to consider that perhaps what I profess to you at meetings is a lie. That the relationship with God is not the most important relationship in my life as by the evidence of my actions. In that, any relationship that's important in my life, I give time to, including my wife. She would divorce me if I give her a one minute, quick little 30 second hello in the morning and 30 second hello and goodbye at night, like I did with God for a couple years in. And please don't, again, don't let me rock the boat. That's just my experience. If it works for you, it's beautiful. But it's been my experience and the experience of my elders that the, every humble 24 hours that I fumble sometimes in this path, I take a step forward. This broad and roomy, beautiful path, it just narrows, narrows in a few ways. But one way pertinent to this conversation, I can't get away with not doing what the big book suggests anymore. Prayer and meditation. To cultivate a relationship with this power by spending time with this power. From that day to this, it's been a few years now. I built a, a prayer life has, been, has grown around me, a meditative life. I get up extra early in the morning and I spend time with God, man. Prayer, meditation, reading spiritual books, writing sometimes, doing two-way prayer sometimes. Throughout the day, I'm always conscious contact, I'm always praying, God, please remove this selfishness, self centeredness Show me who would you have me be and what would you have me do, God? And that's showing up, that, 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 that desire to seek with all my brokenness has manifested itself in many different ways. Couldn't find a job, decent job, a career that would help support my family properly for a few years. My wife, she has a business and she's, she's been the breadwinner of the house for a good many years. I'm just recently, you know, I did the best I could, but. So imagine the turmoil and finance and the fighting, the two alcoholics under the same roof together and, and we both fall asleep spiritually at the same time around the finances thing, imagine that. Right. So one of these times I'm praying, I'm moving. Every time I'm brought back to the fact, I, I, I land in a job that I don't like, not making enough money every time with step work, with spiritual guidance, with sponsorship, I'm brought back to the truth that I have a main purpose in life, and that is not to find a job on my dreams or to build a bank account. There's nothing wrong with desiring that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when I'm attached to it, I'm dead in the water. I have a main purpose, and that is to fit myself to be of maximum service to God and the people about me. What that looked like is one of those times I'm digging the ground with those clam shovels, they call it, hot outside. We're doing fencing building a fence, hating my life. Oh, hating my life. Oh, just in self, self-pity, just depressed. God, who would you, have? please remove the self-centered fears and selfish, selfish thoughts and show me who would you have me be? And what would you have me do, God? And I sit back and I listen. And my eyes are watering because I'm so sick of this. And then I hear the 60 some, 65, 60 year old gentleman that was sitting 10 minutes before me, beside me, who lost his livelihood to the business he had. He's working side by side with me, grinding, shoveling. I hear him. Ali, I've been wanting to kill myself for the last couple of weeks and I can't stop drinking. Can you, can you help me? I prayed, <laughs> power of prayer. And then I open up my mouth and I hear the words come out and I share my experience of what life was like and how bad it was, how it is now, how I'm sober, I have a beautiful life. 
and I get to come to work and I get to search for a job. And then all of a sudden, the same scenario, the same job that I hated is the most beautiful life. I get to be present in my life. Once again, God showed me. You want to get to know me? You get to know my kids. And since then, I've been putting a career that I just is great. I get to support my family now, you know? That's just one, ex one experience. What happens is uh, cultivating a relationship with God through prayer and meditation. And all I've been doing, stepping back, all I've been doing the last few years is with a lot of mistake, clean house, trust God, help others. Clean house, trust God, help others. That's all I've been doing. There's a lot of mistakes too. And I've been stepping back and watching this power do for me what I cannot do for myself. I've been watching in all the power of God, man. I've been watching, man. You cannot tell me there isn't a God because I know God. That's a different story. I no longer believe in God. I know God. Personal God to me. From my experience. From my experience. I've watched them. I, I was homeless, penniless, jobless. We have all those things. And they don't even matter because they don't keep me sober. I watched them as the priceless gifts of life. I, as I have a beautiful wife. We're coming up to eight years of marriage. And we went through some rocky times. But we're good, man. She's my best friend. She's a soldier. Soldier of God, she is. You know, she's a beautiful human being, she does. She is. I watched as my last suicide attempt was 10, 10, 11 years ago, 12 years ago. Six years ago, God gave us a baby boy. Kevin, I saw you, brother, two minutes. I, I watched as God gave us a baby boy. And he's the best thing in my life. Talk about the manifestations of God and talk about source. I love him. I never knew that kind of, this kind of love. I didn't know this kind of love existed until I experienced it. And I'm a good dad. I'm such a good dad, man. I play with him and I laugh at, with him and I tell him that he's handsome and he's, he could be anything he wants. I teach him martial arts and we train and we jog together. He's five or six years old. We jog together, you know? I'm a good dad because of you. Not because of me, because of you. If you're new, I'll end with this. If you're new and if you're newly back, I want you to know that all those priceless stuff, they don't have the power to keep me sober either if I don't have a relationship with God, a current relationship with God. And I pray, I pray that you get the gift of desperation, that you are able to just let go of everything that you think you know and get a sponsor and join the home room and dive in these steps in the middle of the circle and triangle. And watch, watch God do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And experience the God that I'm, we're talking about. But the most important thing is that in times of tough, toughness and difficulty in, the, in life, you will realize that there's more light in you than you know what to do with. And that's the light of God. God bless you. I love you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.